you dream. You build. You persist. And you succeed. Proudly helping Canadian businesses succeed internationally. If you work for yourself or for someone else, you're probably an expert at what you do. If you aren't yet, you will be if you do it long enough. You know what to do to transform the inputs into finished products. You know what can happen to slow you down and you know what can produce better and faster outcomes. In other words, you're standing right in front of your tree and you know it very well. What we'll do today is help you step away from your tree and look at the other trees around you, who they are, what they do, what can slow them down and what can make them work better. We will look at the other trees in the forest of international trade. As you look at the forest, you'll first notice a clearing. At the top and the bottom of the clearing, you see two trees. We'll call the tree at the top of the clearing the buyer tree. If there's a buyer tree, you can guess the name of the other tree, the seller tree. However, since we're talking about international trade, we'll call our seller tree the exporter tree. If you look a bit closer, you notice two parallel paths between the two trees. On one path travels the goods and services sold by the exporter to the buyer, and on the other path travels the payment for the goods and services purchased by the buyer. Between the two paths is a written sign that describes the transaction between the two parties, and this is called the contract. The contract is a description of the transaction and it is agreed to by the buyer and the exporter. It includes a description of the good or service being sold, it identifies the buyer and seller, the date of the transaction, the price, and how payment is to be made. It describes how and under what conditions delivery will occur, what happens if the buyer is not satisfied, etc. For a contract that is produced for a simple transaction, such as buying a pair of shoes, all of the information is included on the invoice. For a complex transaction, such as building a nuclear reactor, you may have one or many contract documents that can be a half meter thick. There are five items that make up the essential elements of international trade. We say international trade because there's a border between the exporter and the buyer. Number one, the exporter. Two, the buyer. Three, the goods and services being sold. Four, the payments. And five, the contract that documents the transaction. That's it. It's as simple as that. Connected to the buyer tree is another path that leads to a source of funds. These are funds available to buy assets like equipment, buildings, inventory, and services. Companies have access to various sources of funds. However, not all sources are available to all companies. Whether certain funds are available or not depends on many factors, such as a company's size, its stage of development, profitability, industry, and whether they have assets to pledge as security. A company may have access to banks, investors, the bond market, profits, and vendors that can make the acquisition of assets possible. Now that we have the transaction and funds to pay for the goods and services, there's an interesting aspect of the transaction that is the main reason for the existence of many institutions in the financial services industry, including the company I work for, Export Development Canada. There is a whole industry created to mitigate the risks caused by this interesting aspect, and that is that the flow along the paths are not synchronized. They do not happen at the same time. Discomfort is caused by the asynchronous flows, and each party seeks to reduce or eliminate the discomfort. I'll explain what I mean with an example. The owner of a marina and tour operation from the lower republic of Sedona has traveled to Canada to negotiate for the purchase of a sailboat. The sailboat is built by a small sailboat manufacturer located on Lake Ontario in the Kingston area. The buyer met the Canadian manufacturer at the Toronto International Boat Show and has since tried it out on Lake Ontario. The buyer is ready to have one built for his marina operation. The buyer understands that the sale price for the sailboat is $300,000 and it will take six months to build. The Canadian manufacturer only starts to build the sailboat with an order. This is due firstly to the substantial cost of $250,000 to build the craft and the customization required for each one. Negotiations start, but opening positions are far apart. The buyer would rather pay when they get the vessel and have had a chance to try it out for a few weeks in their marina and local waters. Will it travel as fast as promised? Will the sail stand up to heavy winds? Will the quality of the carpentry be as good as the showroom model? Will the hull be the right color? Will this small Canadian company be able to complete the vessel on time and on budget? 
The buyer has no experience with this manufacturer, and to remove all the risk and discomfort, payment after all is satisfactory is their best solution. The exporter, on the other hand, would rather be paid the whole amount up front. The exporter does not have $250,000 to pay for the material, labor, and other sailboat building expenses over the six-month build period. The exporter also does not know this buyer very well and is worried that the buyer may change his mind over the six-month period. The exporter would be stuck with a custom-built sailboat to try and sell to someone else. Another worry is whether the buyer will be able to pay for the vessel in six months. The best way to remove all this discomfort and be able to cover construction costs and ensure a profit on the transaction is to ask for the full sale price up front. If each side is stubborn and not willing to consider options to relieve this discomfort, there'd be no deal. Fortunately, the buyer really wants this sailboat and the exporter really wants to make this sale. So negotiations proceed. The two parties finally agree on the following payment terms. There will be three payment installments. First, an installment of $100,000 when the contract is signed, and this is referred to as an advance. Second, an installment of $100,000 on delivery of the sailboat. And third, an installment of $100,000 two months after delivery to allow trial of the vessel in different conditions. So, by obtaining an advance of $100,000, the exporter has partly solved two problems. Firstly, he knows that the buyer is somewhat serious about the purchase. We'll see later why I say somewhat serious. And secondly, he has found part of the $250,000 needed to build the sailboat. He still needs another $150,000 over the six-month build period to buy material, pay his employees, and heat his building. Since the sailboat will cost $250,000 to build, the exporter needs access to another $150,000 over the next six to eight months until payment is received from the buyer for the second and third installments. This can often be available from a line of credit from the company's home financial institution. This can be a bank or a credit union. The need is short term and therefore the financing would also be short term. The term of any financing is usually a function of the useful life of the asset being financed and offered as security to the lender. That is why it is possible to borrow over a 30 year period with a house as security and only over five years for a car that has a shorter useful life. If the borrower is not able to repay the debt, the financial institution would take and sell their security to repay the debt. Our exporter therefore visits a financial institution to get access to a short term loan for $150,000. The exporter is asked to bring the company's balance sheet to the meeting. Since this is a short-term exposure, the financial institution will look for a short-term asset as security that it can take and sell to repay any outstanding amount in the case the exporter cannot repay the borrowed amount. In general, financial institutions in Canada will assess the value of a company's short-term assets in a similar manner and allow the company to borrow a certain amount based on the value of these short-term assets. Looking at the balance sheet, short-term assets are usually cash, accounts receivable, inventory, and work in progress. Accounts receivable are amounts owed to the company from recent customers. Inventory, in this case, consists of raw materials and components scheduled for use in a finished product. Fiberglass, masts, rigging, brackets, nuts and bolts. Work in process consists of material, components, and the value of labor that has started to be transformed into the finished product. For an operating line of credit, a financial institution will typically allow a company to borrow up to 75% of the value of domestic accounts receivable that are less than 90 days old. In this case, 75% of $800,000. They will not consider the value of foreign accounts receivable, in this case, 0% of $200,000. And they will allow 50% of the value of the inventory, in this case, 50% of $500,000. They will not consider the value of work in process, or 0% of $500,000. Based on this company's most recent balance sheet, the exporter would be allowed to borrow up to $850,000. Assuming the exporter has not borrowed the whole amount, the remaining $150,000 required to complete the contract can be borrowed using this line of credit. Now that that problem is solved, the exporter can start negotiating with suppliers. You notice that we see the similar transaction components with the exporter as the buyer and suppliers selling parts of the final products. The buyer pays for the goods and services and the transaction is described in a contract. There are two suppliers of major components, the engine and the sale. The price of the engine is $25,000 and the price of the sale is $50,000. The buyer has requested that an engine co-engine be installed on the sailboat. The exporter has never dealt with Engine Co. and this is a large company and the best deal the exporter can negotiate with Engine Co. is a COD or cash on delivery sale. 
Therefore, to not use up $25,000 of the $100,000 advance and not to pay interest on amounts borrowed on the line of credit until absolutely necessary, the exporter decides to push the delivery of the engine as close to the delivery date as possible. The exporter has more leverage with the supplier of the sale. This is one of three small companies in the area that make a very good quality product. This sale maker is very eager to sign a contract with the exporter and hopes to sign more contracts in the future. The exporter, however, imposes very difficult payment terms. No payment until the exporter receives full payment from the final installment in eight months. This is to make sure that the sale survives the trial period imposed by the buyer. The sale manufacturer's costs are $40,000, consisting of canvas, thread, labor, and heat and electricity for the building. The sale manufacturer does not have $40,000 to pay for the manufacturing costs, so this company must also seek a source of short-term funds over the eight-month period until payment is received. As the exporter did with their bank, the sale manufacturer visits his financial institution. This institution will assess the company's short-term assets to see if they are comfortable with the security the company has to offer for any advance. If a line of credit is not possible, the company may need to offer other collateral or a borrow from another lender, a family member maybe. So, our exporter now has the financing needed to cover the cost of building the sailboat and has lined up all the suppliers. The contract, however, cannot be signed yet. Let's go back to the payment terms negotiated with the buyer. With the first installment, the buyer agreed to advance the exporter $100,000. This is very good for the exporter, but it did not come without conditions. The buyer is willing to provide this advance only if the exporter can guarantee the buyer a reimbursement of the advance if the buyer is not satisfied with the sailboat. In other words, if the terms of the contract are not respected, the buyer wants the advance returned. The buyer needs a guarantee that the exporter will perform as expected. The form of guarantee that the buyer is looking for is quite specific. For the buyer, the guarantee starts with a financial institution in his country. The local bank will confirm to the buyer that it can be repaid. The Lower Sedona Financial Institution is willing to provide such a confirmation to the buyer only if it receives a similar confirmation from a corresponding Canadian financial institution. The Canadian financial institution is willing to provide that confirmation if the exporter can provide it with sufficient security in case it has to make good on that promise. The common financial instrument used in cases such as this is a letter of credit or LC. This is a demand instrument. What I mean is that all the buyer needs to do to be repaid their $100,000 advance is to call their local financial institution. The Lower Sedona Bank would then communicate with the Canadian bank and that bank would immediately transfer the funds to Lower Sedona. No questions asked. As it releases the funds, the Canadian bank would be reimbursed by the exporter, usually from security held for the LC. Typically, the security required to backstop the LC is a portion of the assets that also secure the line of credit. This means that a portion of the line of credit is frozen and becomes unavailable to the exporter to purchase inventory and pay other expenses to generate sales. If the line of credit assets are all pledged, sometimes the advance itself is frozen to secure the LC. There's something wrong with that option since the advance is required to pay for the building of the sailboat. Let's hope the company has assets to pledge as security for the LC. Otherwise, there's no LC, no advance, no three installment payment terms, and probably no contract. For this example, we'll assume that the LC can be posted and that the contract is signed. The sale proceeds. The buyer is satisfied with the new acquisition and returns for a second and third vessel in the following years. The vessel becomes very popular among marinas and tour operators in Lower Sedona and neighboring countries. Seeing an opportunity in this new market, the buyer and the exporter decide to enter into a partnership to build sailboats in Lower Sedona and to sell them to marinas and tour operators in the region. Each partner contributes $5 million towards the $10 million setup costs of the factory. In addition to the setup costs, the exporter partner contributes to the manufacturing know-how and the buyer partner contributes to the market knowledge. The business does very well. It breaks even the first year, generates a small profit in year two, and good profits in years three, four, and five. Depending on the political and financial health of the Republic of Lower Sedona, our exporter's foreign investment may be exposed to certain risks. In year five, for example, our exporter would like the successful foreign operation to pay dividends to the Canadian parent. 
In the last few years, however, the country has undergone serious financial challenges and the Central Bank of Lower Sedona has restricted access to US dollars and euros, the most common hard currencies. Our exporter therefore cannot convert any local currency into a hard currency or transfer any hard currency outside the country. On occasion in some countries, tax or other measures are sometimes introduced that target foreign-owned companies. These measures make the profitable operation of the company impossible and cause the foreign-owned company to close its doors, resulting in the loss of their investment. In other rarer cases, the country can simply nationalize the company and force the owners to give up their shares and assets or sell them at a very low price. These are the types of risks to which foreign investments are exposed. Before we talk about the clouds that hover over our force, let's summarize what we've talked about so far. One, trade starts with the transaction described in a contract. This is a commercial relationship. Two, flows between the exporter and the buyer are not synchronized, and this causes stress and is a source of risk. Three, sometimes exporters must provide performance-based guarantees to their buyers. And four, sometimes exporters will invest abroad to access new markets, suppliers, or other opportunities. All forests are affected by the weather, and of course this one is no different. Clouds float above the forest. They're not part of the forest, but they have an influence on it. There are three types of clouds. White clouds are nice and soft, pillow looking. They sometimes shield you from the bright sun. These are the fair weather clouds under which you go with the family to a picnic or to the beach. Gray clouds are menacing and challenging. You're not too certain what is about to happen. Will they break up and become white, or will they become dark clouds? The dark clouds may be a sign of a storm and can generate lightning bolts that can actually destroy parts of the forest. The color of the cloud depends on your perception of the cloud, and we'll see why later. You may need to influence the clouds and you must not ignore them. If you do, they can blindside you and events they cause may threaten your survival in the forest. The first cloud is called the Canadian Government Regulations and Policies. How has the North American Free Trade Agreement affected your business? NAFTA may be a very good agreement for your business, and this would be a white cloud. Otherwise, this cloud could be gray or even dark. If Canada suddenly announced a trade embargo on goods to and from Lower Sedona because of their human rights record in the month prior to delivery of the sailboat, this would be a very dark cloud for our exporter. This same cloud may be very white and fluffy for a neighbor who applauds the government's actions. There are also regulations and policies in the country into which you are selling or investing that may affect how you can trade in that country. Canadian manufacturers of transit equipment, for example, must comply with the United States Buy America Act. This act requires foreign suppliers of buses and trains to U.S. transit authorities to acquire certain components in the U.S. and ensure that 60% of the value of the equipment is sourced in the United States. They also have to assemble the final product in the U.S. If you build a tugboat for use in Denmark, for example, noise in the cabin must not be higher than a regulated decibel limit. Compliance with local regulations are prerequisites to access these markets. Another cloud is the non-government organization or NGO cloud. NGOs have a significant and increasing influence in the functioning of international trade in many sectors, especially in those sectors affected by environmental and human rights issues. If you agree with the NGO, then this cloud is white. If their influence is threatening the signing of a contract or the continued existence of the way you do your business, then this cloud could be gray or dark. International financial institutions affect the functioning of the forest by supporting projects that may otherwise not get support from the purely commercial financial markets. Institutions like the World Bank, export credit agencies, and regional development banks are examples of IFIs. The fifth cloud represents the international regulations and agreements that also affect the functioning of the forest. World Trade Organization, or the WTO, is a good example of an organization set up to level the playing field for trade among member countries. This can affect the growth of certain parts of the forest. Now, how does Export Development Canada interact with the forest? EDC was created by the Government of Canada to assist exporters to be part of and to grow in the forest. EDC is not a tree or a path. EDC offers solutions for those who travel on a path that is unclear, difficult, or dangerous. One of the solutions EDC provides is financing. Do you remember the different sources of funds available to the foreign buyer to buy the sailboat? 
EDC is one of those sources. EDC can be a source of financing not only to the foreign buyers of Canadian goods and services, but also to exporters and to Canadian companies that expand their operation by investing abroad. In 2009, for example, EDC provided almost $12 billion of financing, either directly or by guaranteeing a financial institution that provided the funds. Now, most people have a hard time understanding how large one billion is. Just think about it for a second. Actually, speaking of seconds, if you were to count one number per second, how long do you think it would take to count to one billion? What do you think? A month? A year? Two years? Well, if you take out your calculator, you'll see that it would take just over 31 and a half years to count to one billion seconds. So that makes a billion quite a large number. Now back to our forest. When the exporter approached the financial institution for short-term financing to pay for the cost of building the sailboat, the institution allowed the company to borrow up to 75% of the company's domestic receivables. With an EDC accounts receivable insurance policy assigned to the institution, the exporter can usually borrow up to 90% of both domestic and foreign accounts receivable. In our case, that's an increase of $300,000 in available short-term financing. The other benefit of the policy is that if the buyer does not pay the insured exporter the amount of the receivable, the policy will cover up to 90% of the exporter's loss. In 2009, EDC supported almost $59 billion in exports with accounts receivable insurance. Remember when our exporter had to provide security for a letter of credit that gave the buyer comfort that their advance would be repaid if the exporter did not perform? EDC can replace that security with a guarantee to the financial institution. If the LC is called and the funds are returned to the buyer, then EDC will reimburse the financial institution the amount dispersed. This guarantee is one kind of performance guarantee that EDC offers. In 2009, EDC provided just over $9.5 billion to this type of solution in support of exporters. For those companies that invest abroad, EDC provides political risk insurance to protect against loss caused, for example, by overt or creeping expropriation, or by not being able to convert local currency into hard currency, or not being able to transfer hard currencies from the host country. In 2009, EDC provided just over $2.5 billion of political risk insurance. That's a total of $83 billion in support solutions in 2009, offered by EDC to those who participate in the forest of international trade. So, I hope you agree that there's a lot going on in the forest with many trees, paths, and flows along those paths. There are entities such as EDC that help the flow along those paths and clouds that affect the overall growth of the forest. It is important to find your way on this map and when you are clinging to your tree because that's what you do best or you're lost in the forest, that you can step back, recognize where you are and be able to proceed on your way. Thanks and I wish you success in the forest of international trade.